Now, Margaret is known for her research into music performance anxiety. She seeks to understand how learning and performance can be improved using self-regulated learning and emotion regulation skills, elucidating best practice methods to build confidence, health and resilience in order to maximize performance potential in music and other performing arts, sports, public speaking and academic disciplines. Now, I might take the liberty of also adding that Margaret has one of the sharpest intellects and is one of the most innovative practitioners in the field of music performance science. And I think it's worth noting that Margaret is also an academic beacon of resilience, drive and generosity and has influenced countless others in the field, many of whom I know are here today. We had that session this morning around mentorship and I know that Margaret has and continues to mentor and to inspire a whole new generation of young and upcoming researchers in the field. So without further ado, I'd love us all to put our hands together and welcome Dr. Margaret Osborne. Oh, wow. I'm really touched by that introduction. <laughs> um, goodness, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. And I'm hoping you can hear me and you can see the slide and not notes. Yes, great. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to my presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm giving this presentation. That's the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and extend my respects to the traditional owners past and present and acknowledge that this land was a meeting place to convene and share knowledge just as we are today. And I extend my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which you're listening today. I'd also like to offer huge thanks to the AMPS organizing committee for the keynote invitation. Um, I hold AMPS in, in a lot of fondness. It was the first external group to Sydney Uni where I did my PhD that I spoke to. That was at UNSW, um, chaired by Kate Stevens. Um, I'm grateful and humbled by the opportunity this society uh, has given because there is a group of stellar academics and practitioners here. And so considering this, I thought, how do I add my unique perspective to this uh, wealth of expertise in the virtual room? And so I'm framing my talk today to share the parcels of knowledge that I draw upon, a little kit bag of tools and strategies that I call upon, whether I'm teaching or in private practice or doing research with musicians, whether they're emerging mid-career or in the mature stages of their career and still beleaguered by uh, ghosts of an anxious past. And I know from research in the literature and from personal experience that they work, and this um, title and the person here, Carla Blackwood, came up with the phrase, uh, nail it down the middle. It's actually part of one of the strategies that I'm going to talk it, about it later um, in the talk. So yeah. just hold on to that for a moment. So Carla is a French horn uh, faculty at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music and, and, uh, and stellar performer. So one of my referring to when I'm considering well-being. Well, our goal could be a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's according to the World Health Organization. And we can also consider it as health as a resource for making music, so supporting the musicians that make the music and also making music as a resource for health. And really nicely as a loop and a bookend today, at the end of my talk, I'm going to be uh, touching on self-compassion and how that can help uh, the mental sort of psychological well-being of performers. But also Sabrina McKenzie later on in the day is talking about self-compassion that can be drawn from um, engaging with music. So that's a really interesting um, touch on the balance there. So what is mental well-being? in musicians, well, we conceive of it more broadly along eight factors. So this is the fit to perform framework um, adopted by the Healthy Conservatoires group in the UK. You can actually see that it, they've drawn from um, the Department of Health and Human Services who've drawn from Margaret Swarbrick's work uh, up in the corner top left there. 
And you can see there's sort of eight elements that really come together that we need to think about when we consider well-being and performing artists. And we've got the emotional, we've got the physical and the social elements that the World Health Organization uh, mentioned. But we've also got some other uh, areas that are particular to the performing arts group. For example, occupational well-being, the um, capacity for performing artists, artists to sustain a, a long-term satisfying career is, is challenging. And then alongside that, we can think of um, financial well-being. So the boom bust nature of the, um, the uh, type of industry that it is can really um, impact on well-being. So why should we be concerned about well-being? Well, until recently, uh, considerations of health and well-being in musicians was not really uh, looked at or swept under the carpet. So the statistics, however, for poor health in musicians is poor. Um, musicians' health-related problems are defined as psychological or physical symptoms, including hearing problems that arise from music making. And they can occur as a result of personal, situational and societal pressures that stress musicians past their healthy emotional and physiological limits. So performance related problems, which is where impacts to psychological well-being and musicians falls under, remains uh, persistently high despite decades of work and health and um, promotion and research in the sector. And you can see in the slide here, if we're looking professionally or at university age musicians, the rates of performance related problems are quite um, high and similar. Uh, school age musicians, the rates are a little lower. The research in that group is, is less. However, the risks are remaining. And the consideration also is that traditionally um, work has been considered sort of individually, either physical or psychological health separately, but the two influence and interact with each other. For example, we know that anxiety significantly and depression significantly and positively correlate with the frequency and severity of performance related musculoskeletal problems, bodily pain and pain interfering with practice and performance. So that directly relates to well-being and performance outcomes. So what are the risk factors for performance-related problems? Um, some work that Anne Shoebridge and I have done uh, examining um, so risk factors with musicians in particular, we've got factors intrinsic to the musician, so within the individual's mu uh, musician's control. So excess playing tension, a sudden increase in playing time, playing posture, technique, insufficient warm-ups, fatigue, anxiety, and music performance anxiety, which are sort of separately delineated there. And then you've got risk factors that are external, sort of outside the musician's control. Repertoire, performance scheduling, physical setup, including poor seating, rehearsal content and structure, sound exposure, touring. And you've got a set of risk factors that are the interplay between the two. So looking at these risk factors, we also then considered what's the literature telling us about how to best manage these risk factors. So we looked at music industry research, performance science, performing arts medicine, higher education, behavior change, wellness science, occupation, public health, even business health insurance. And we can find that this model of behavior change offered by Michi um, the COM-B model comes to, to bear as um, probably the best model at this point. You can see Naomi Norton has also considered um, the literature of, um, of musicians' uh, health and wellness in relation to this model. And it concerns three concentric layers. There's multiple layers that have to be addressed in order to support uh, a well-being for musicians. Uh, the hub is the COM-B, so the capability of the person, physical and psychological, the opportunities uh, for them to en enact that well-being and the motivation to do so. And it considers the individual in a societal context and the body as an integrated system. 
And what's really interesting is when I think about this in relation to some recent work that Cindy Watkin um, has conducted, looking at the um, psychological well-being of professional musicians and what compromises that in the orchestral workplace. And so, for example, self-determination theory, theory briefly has three basic psychological needs that need to be met in order to sustain well-being and, and optimal motivation. So autonomy, competence and relatedness. But what she found was there was a lack of autonomy in these professional uh, orchestral musicians through a perceived lack of ability to change process, a perceived lack of respect and feeling themselves as the product within the organisation, excluded from effective input into organisational decisions. So that's the individual in the green feeling excluded from what's going on in the grey. Feeling incompetent, so feeling that technical standards are impossible to attain within their immediate orchestral environment. And a feeling of a lack of supportive relationships with colleagues, given the musicians felt that they or their colleagues were under surveillance or threat, particularly as they began to age. So I'm going to sort of stop and run. I'm going to put a flag in the landscape, as it were, of health at this point and park that behaviour change model and that framework. And we're going to move on to individual factors. But I thought that it would be imperative that you should know and appreciate that whatever I now talk about in relation to individual strategies a musician can use, they're only as effective as the environment and the context that surrounds them and allows the strategy strategies to be effective. So I'm now going to funnel in and think about well-being as it relates to optimal music performance. And Aaron Williaman has offered this model that I constantly go to. So yes, uh, understanding that musical competencies are, um, are established, but we have physical well-being and psychological well-being, and all three come together to support a musician to enhance their ability to exceed the average level of performance and perform well. Now we know that music performance anxiety is the number one death knell to psychological well-being. So that falls into the mental category of performance related problems. We know that musicians are in the top five occupational groups who are most at risk for mental illness. And interestingly enough, looking at research pre and post pandemic, um, this is uh, in the UK, we can see that with large, uh, large thousands of, of performing artists and musicians, you've got 70 odd percent experiencing anxiety and panic attacks and two thirds or so feeling depressed. Interestingly, that was both Spiro, you know, post pandemic with uh, compared to Gross, which is pre pandemic, but also which is something interesting, which touches on the complexity and I guess the dual continuum model of well-being in relation to mental illness and psychiatric diagnoses is that you can experience more or less well-being uh, alongside uh, mental illness. So it was also found by Spiro that, you know, half to two thirds of performing arts professionals um, could be classified as having moderate to flourishing well-being. Now, flourishing well-being is the sense of experiencing positive, experiencing positive emotion, um, joy, happiness, and social and psychological functioning. So, feeling that the musician can contribute to the world in meaningful ways, that they like their personality, and they feel confident in expressing their opinions. And languishing is, of course, the the opposite end of that, which is experiencing emptiness and stagnation. So that's, again, there's, there's nuances and complexities here. If we look at music performance anxiety, it's the most common risk to psychological well-being in our Australian professional musicians, particularly for females and particularly for those younger than ages of uh, 30 years of age. It adversely affects up to 70% of professional musicians, a little more in children and adolescents and youth orchestras. And it can cause tertiary music students, about half of them, to seek help for distress and impaired music performance. So that's that's why I guess I continue to uh, be interested in, the, in this phenomena. So what is it? Well, we can think of music performance anxiety as the expression of some physiological changes that occur. So your heart rate increases, 
your muscles increase in their tension, your throat tightens, your diaphragm tightens. So if you're a singer or a woodwind player or a breath, you're going to be affected by that. Your mouth goes dry. Um, and attentionally, uh, oh, interestingly, physical, uh, excessive physiological arousal of this nature prior to and during a performance is one of the top three causes of music performance anxiety in Australian professional orchestral musicians. So attentionally, mental changes occur towards thoughts and worries of performance failure and catastrophe and the consequences of those. The mind can go blank. We can have difficulty concentrating and the attention is focused on perceived threats. Problems then ensue in performance quality. So the distortion of uh, perception of time, timing problems, impaired fine motor coordination, jerky movements, faulty decision-making, inflexible or impulsive thinking and becoming distracted by this inner noise. This is more likely to occur when under situations of high evaluative um, uh, performance. So where there's high ego investment or threat potential. So <coughs> if you're performing solo, for example, or to a large group of performers or the performers or and or the audience, sorry, a large group of audience members and those who are um, quite uh, have a high level of expertise, for example. So it's more likely to trigger distorted perceptions, overestimation of likelihood and consequences of being negatively evaluated, and particularly in that social context. Now, they can be sort of teased apart into two sorts of groups. So we have on the one hand, we have people who or musicians who can generally feel an overarching sense of, of core beliefs around failure, the belief that they have failed, will inevitably fail, or are fundamentally inadequate, that they feel a bit dependent or incompetent, they feel unable to handle their everyday responsibilities without help from others, and they feel particularly vulnerable to harm or illness, have an exaggerated fear that an imminent catastrophe will strike at any time and they'll be unable to prevent it. So they can feed into thoughts of, you know, being, I'm not good enough, I'm unable to cope. But you have another group who have more circumscribed um, sort of worries, so particularly in relation to the music performance tasks. So they might be thinking things like, I'm struggling to perform this particular piece of repertoire. And that comes from a history. It comes from a history of past relevant experiences, um, a vulnerability, for example, to tray anxiety, a tendency to feel uh, more emotional across uh, in everyday situations, coupled with um, the learning of, of or exposure to destructive beliefs around performing, um, such as pressure to succeed and for perfection from teachers and from parents. And the, again, uh, it's more profound when it's coupled with critical aversive performance events. For example, uh, a very important performance early in one's um, performance career and development as a musician, um, if there's a, a trauma or a catastrophe that can, can stay with the performer you know, for a very long time and feed into these processes. So at the end of all this, you have two options, generally speaking. You have a reduction in uh, a motivation to perform, so some sort of avoidance. Um, it can be sort of covert disengagement or avoidance, so not making eye contact with examiners or auditioners, avoiding challenging yourself with difficult, difficult repertoire, avoiding being vulnerable in a performance, playing technically well, but other important dimensions such as expressivity might be a little lacking. Alternatively, some musicians engage in coping strategies and they re-engage in evaluative performances. So how can we get musicians to profit and engage in these coping strategies? Well, we know that we can, musicians who have appraisals such as these, so when Gary and I tested um, Lazarus's cognitive motivational relational theory, Anxiety was less, confidence was higher, and end of semester recital score, uh, exam scores were higher in conservatorium of music uh, musicians who 
had these sorts of uh, coping appraisals. They're in control, they have res responsibility in preparing, they have all the resources they need to cope and they have what it takes to be successful. So the way that I believe is most effective um, that I'm working with these days <laughs> to promote this state is using the power of psychological flexibility. And this can be defined as the ability to choose to do what works in order to move toward who or what is important to you, even in the presence of obstacles. So it's basically like building two skills at the same time. So if you imagine, you know, the, 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 the metaphor where you're rubbing your belly and uh, you're mindfully accepting as you're rubbing your belly, accepting all your sensations, your physical sensations, your worries, and you're not responding to those symptoms of emotional distress. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm <laughs> rubbing my belly here. So your music performance anxiety is coming up or other psychological problems which can inhibit psychological well-being. And then plus you add the skill of a new behaviour, something that you value and you commit yourself to engage in during your performances, even when you feel distressed. Okay, and yes, I'm doing <laughs> both at the same time. I have been practicing that. Yeah, it takes practice. So what exactly are we practicing? Well, we're practicing six aspects of psychological flexibility. There are six core processes, which is hence the hex, uh, the hexaflex in um, hex flexibility. So we can increase uh, flexibility in the presence of unwanted symptoms by enhancing our mindfulness uh, to sustain attention then to performance relevant stimuli. So awareness of all stimuli around us. Cultivating a willingness to perform with MPA symptoms present and disentangling ourselves from MPA related thoughts and cognitions and worries, freeing up attentional resources back on task. Additionally, we can help uh, to learn to observe our symptoms so they're not pers personalized or interpreted as being part of oneself. For example, you know, I'm not good enough versus I'm having the thought that I'm not good enough. So building some space between those sorts of judgments and thoughts. Engaging in committed actions and so bringing oneself to regularly engage in valued actions so performance related behavior is more purposeful to what's meaningful to you and to identify and clarify your values which might provide meaning to performance and practice. Now, this work comes from acceptance and commitment um, therapy, uh, which has moved into coaching and training paradigms, depending on the, um, I guess, level of psychopathology of the, of the clientele or people you're working with. And these techniques help to reduce they don't aim to reduce anxiety symptoms, but that does occur, uh, interestingly, alongside working with these processes. So psychological flexibility in a musician, what does that look like? Well, that would be someone who's able to have worries and anxiety about performances, but not letting them get in the way of their success. To have... Um, making mistakes while performing and then being able to move past it, to remain in the present moment while performing, to still perform even if they don't feel like it. And then the opposite of that, which is more inflexible, where memories of previous mistakes prevent them from performing in ways they find important, um, performance-related difficulties preventing them from giving meaningful performances and thoughts and feelings that prevent them from making progress while practicing. So. I'm researching, um, we've developed this scale with the, uh, my colleagues here. And I wonder, you know, you might want to take a moment just to score this for yourself. Um, what you can see, of course, is that you'd reverse score one, four, and seven and total it up and have a consideration of what that value is. Conservatorium uh, of Music students in Australia and the United States generally uh, report a mean of around 30. So that's just something uh, for you to consider and have a think about. Now, we know that these items 
uh, well, psychological inflexibility as a construct, yes, it negatively relates to performance flow. So performance flow and being in a state of flow is typically um, described as a character of an optimal performance. In and of itself, it's negatively predictive. But if you add music performance anxiety in the mix, it accounts for all that relationship. So performance anxiety fully mediates the relationship between inflexibility and flow. And also when we look at this uh, musician's action and acceptance and action questionnaire, we can see that it adds um, a more incremental validity to um, thinking about this state of psychological flexibility and its relationship to um, performance outcomes. So for example, scores in a recent adjudicated music exam. The MAC is um, uh, better able to differentiate and predict these scores than a more general uh, measure of psychological inflexibility, the acceptance and action questionnaire. So it is a useful measure. So something to keep in mind. So also, how would you develop this thing called psychological flexibility? Well, using uh, the psychological flexibility matrix is a really neat way to conceptualize how to put this state into practice. So what we want to do, being flexible, is we want to stretch and flex in, to be in balance across all four quadrants. So what's above the horizontal line are things that people can observe you doing. So behaviours that you could be observed doing. And underneath the horizontal line are the thoughts, feelings, sensations and images that are going on that people can't see. And we can direct our behaviour and our action towards, first of all, what matters. What represents the life and the qualities that you most wish to live? What are your values? We would then think about what behaviours support those values and help you achieve the things you desire in your life. On the flip side, what are the thoughts and feelings and memories that you tend to want to get away from and avoid? And the things that you do to get away from those uncomfortable inner experiences. So if we, what we want to do, of course, is to consider and move towards the right. But we also need to be aware that what's happening on the left will, will always be present, but we need to build the skills to, to cope with that. So for example, in music, we could think of values such as artistic beauty, creativity, and mastery. Thoughts of, I'm going to nail it right down the middle, the intention for an audition performance. And you can think in ways that help separate you from those um, negative catastrophic uh, thoughts, such as, I'm having the thought that I'm going to fail. Thanks, mind. <laughs> there's you and there's your mind and there's a separation or a delineation between the two. They can sit in, in parallel. And what you would do to match the, uh, get the values in action is to practice, but you would practice in a deliberate way. You might simulate your performances, seek out performance practice. You might seek out creative experiences, positive social connections, and exercise to build your physical fitness. Because of course, physical well-being is a really important part of optimizing music performance. I can't see now, that. Hello, <laughs> whoever that was. Who's, um, what gets you out of um, that state, that optimal state, are uh, emotions of fear, anxiety, dread, thoughts of I can't do this, that isn't fair. Maybe I'll be sick and I won't perform. What are they gonna think? Am I, I'm not good enough. The what if thinking, what if I make a mistake? You're racing hard, you're shaking, you're feeling tense, faint, and having memories and fantasies of catastrophic performances. And what that can do is cause you to sort of choose repertoire below standard, for example, to feign illness, for example, to practice. Oh, hang on, but we had practice as a good thing, right? Well, mm -mm, there's types of practice. So this practice might be very mindless and um, not very challenging. Exercise. Oh, well, hang on. You said, I thought exercise was a good thing. Well, yes, there's the purpose. What purpose is the behavior serving? So if it's to move away from what's uncomfortable, you might exercise and over-exercise to the point where you're so fatigued 
you can't perform well and you could you know self-sabotage but also attribute a performance failure or your poor well-being to that um, over exercising for example and ultimately uh, feelings of avoidance or behaviors of avoidance I should say so focusing on the green there's a reason why it's been green because that is where we start that's what's most important and it's not quite Simon Sinek's version of start with why but let's think about the purpose you have for the performance the performer that you are so I'm thinking to get you or asking you now to consider yourselves as a performer uh, a musician or even today uh, as a public speaker uh, in the conference so what do you value about being the performer that you're asked to be? You could value being an expressive musician. You could value being an expressive and engaging musician. You could add to that then examples of valued action that support those, um, those values, expressing your emotions, the thoughts and emotions of your character and what the composer wants to communicate. You can have more than one value, for example, being expressive and also technically skilled and focusing on proper technique and learning new techniques. And you can put them all together to form a mission statement that you, know, you can put into your music case, you can put into your repertoire folder somewhere that reminds you of the reason wh why you're doing what you're doing and to help you sort of balance and stretch and manage the uncomfortable thoughts and feelings that uh, exist with performance anxiety. Now, what's really interesting are the threads of connection between different areas of work. And I got really excited when I realized that as part of self-regulated learning and looking at a, a microanalysis that operationalize, operationalizes self-regulated learning in musicians, Task value is something that differentiates high achieving musicians uh, at the conser at conservatory musicians from low achieving. There are other elements too, I can see that, but task value is something that's consistently differentiating those high achieving performance. And task value sits within um, a three phase learning model. It's in the planning forethought phase of performance. And then you play or practice your, uh, your repertoire and then you review what you've done according to very specific goals and strategies that you selected to use at the beginning. And we know that proactive, higher achieving music students have higher quality forethought and performance processes. So let's get back to or down to mm, the nitty gritty. What was it? One of those top three things that professional musicians really struggle with is that excessive physiological arousal optimal activation and we know that that precedes an optimal music performance and so that's why I've devoted a lot of time and work and developed a, a subject along with Don Immel here at the conservatorium that's broadly structured around this centering technique it's a pre-performance routine that works on multiple levels quiet eye um, gaze anchoring clear intentions, so stepping into all that, the values work and all the work supporting um, the importance of, of effective goals and smart goals. For example, I'm going to nail it right down the middle. Carla said this as an example in our class when she was uh, demonstrating how she uses elements and parts of this technique for her audition um, preparation. And I can tell you when she said it, there were no, you knew she wasn't joking and she was dead serious. She's going to nail the tone and the expression and everything right down the middle of the bell. Breathing, working to downregulate that excessive physiological arousal, releasing muscle tension, preparing your body for action, working on all the work of mental rehearsal and imagery and visualization that we know supports optimal performance and directing our energy out. So containing it, Understanding you don't want to battle with this energy. You're going to have it regardless, but how can we focus it and, and you know, moderate it to our benefit? And we know that teaching this technique, again, helps conservatoire students feel more prepared, more confident, more courageous, more focused, and reduce 
performance energy or that performance anxiety. We also know that it works in practice, but it's kind of less, you know, compelling or like astounding if you're doing it uh, in, you know, rooms such as this when you're not triggered by the stress of a high pressure performance situation such as this. So what we need to do is work along the principles of acclimatization, where we know that training under mild levels of anxiety can prevent choking when people are required to perform at higher levels of anxiety. And due to the costs and accessibility issues of, of accessing halls like this and you know, large audiences like this, work has been done around, you know, principally in the UK and Canada to simulate performances to acclimatize to the real life stresses in psychologically and physically safe environments by projecting audiences and examiners on a wall, but still being in a room, uh, usually the conservatorium with lights and so on. And the audience are programmed to do you know, various different things, um, respond favorably or not. And physiologically, the symptoms in the performer and the subjective experience of stress does approximate it does step and reach towards what is that ex what's experienced in a real life performance scenario. But there are problems with this. It's attached to, it's semi-immersive for a start and it's attached to a physical location. And in COVID and in lockdowns, particularly in Melbourne, uh, my colleagues and I were then left wondering, well, how are we going to get our musicians to experience performing when they can't get into the conservatorium building? So um, with my colleagues, Dr. Slimes Glasser and Ben Lovebridge, we've started a project where we are, we are reimagining music performance through the establishment of a virtual performance hall. And one aspect of this research is to offer a more contextually, contextually valid, fully immersive VR experience in which to test coping strategies, which is principally the centering technique. So in this protocol and this test, I taught Solange the centering technique before, um, uh, for a number of weeks before exposure. And the exposure task was uh, for her to be in, in VR, in, you know, um, with the equipment on, in Richie's Plank uh, Experience app, walking the plank. If anyone knows this app, you will know that it triggers the <laughs> fight flight response that's characteristic of extreme performance anxiety, it triggers it reliability, uh, reliably. And we also know in research um, in various contexts that it does so as well. So we exposed Solange in one session to a number of different tasks where she was asked to walk the plank without the centering intervention and then to center and walk the plank, to uh, have her instrument and walk the plank and attempt to play and then have a centering intervention before taking the instrument, walking the plank and attempting to play. And what it looked like um, is sort of demonstrated here. So drawing also on the work of, of telehealth, where I was using the centering technique with, with clients, um, I was on Zoom. Solange was in her living room in the, in the Oculus Quest, um, it, it submer or immersed in Richie's plank, which you can see on the right. And that was her, her vision. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, top left level one, the first level, her heart rate is going through the roof, 158. No intervention, first time. Level four, heart rate still elevated above baseline, which is roughly around 70 or 80 beats per minute because she's performing, but she's also had the intention of now I'm going to perform confidently and safely within a guided centering that I was providing. And you can see over the levels of exposure, a reduction in subjective units of distress or anxiety. You can see the first one's 99, the top was 100. It was, she couldn't imagine anything much, more, much worse really. And confidence is moving in the opposite direction. And you can see, well, Surely it's just an effect of repeated exposure. Well, yes, I, we can't separate that. But can you see the difference between level three and level four in terms of the confidence rating? It went up by 30. And the only difference was whether or not we 
she did a guided centering beforehand. So that's something that we're continuing to explore and we're continuing to explore in uh, Ovation, which is a public speaking app, and then designing our own uh, music performance virtual reality app with scans of our performance halls in the beautiful Ian Potter South Bank Centre. Okay, so towards the end of it now, sometimes no matter how hard you prepare and no matter what you do, the performance doesn't quite go to plan. And what we also know is by looking at acceptance and commitment coaching, which is drawn from the therapeutic method, with Sarah Mahoney, for example, here, who was taught, she's a singing teacher, she was taught by David Junkos, a clinical psychologist, how to um, uh, implement act, act or acceptance and commitment, commitment coaching with uh, musicians in teaching scenarios. Now, Sarah looked at transcripts of um, words and dialogue throughout the sessions. And at the first session, you can see it's very, it, there's negative, um, yes, worry oriented uh, language, anxious, um, feeling panicky. And at the final session, the language is reflective of more flexible uh, constructs, uh, thinking of opportunities, thinking of progress, thinking of goals, mindfulness, confidence, and self-compassion. And self-compassion is an area that is now starting to be looked into with, um, with performing artists. It has a history, uh, a recent history of um, evidence base with athletes, elite athletes, and compassion and self-compassion is a sensitivity to suffering in ourselves and others with a commitment to try and alleviate and prevent it. We know that it's valuable for competitors. It counteracts undesired cognitive and emotional responses associated with difficult performances, image, injury and body image. We know that it is associated with adaptive physiological responding, that fight flight response the heart rate variability is um, increased following recalled failures when people are guided in a self-compassionate exercise. And we know that it reduces self-criticism, rumination and concern over mistakes. So well-being is enhanced and psychological distress is reduced. Now I'm plugging this article because, and I'm happy to send it to anyone who wants to email me because it might be behind the firewall if you're not with the university library, because there, are supplementary materials of uh, imagery and writing exercises to develop a compassionate self, um, which are really, um, you know, really moving um, to develop strength, courage, wisdom, warmth, and commitment to your craft. And why is this important? Why am I interested? Why are we interested in exploring this further with performing artists? Well, we know in elite athletes, there is a systematic and obvious relationship between the degree of well-being and self-compassion. You can see flourishing and moderate, much higher self-compassion scores. So where have we been today? We've been started off looking at performance-related problems, looking at the individual musician in a context. We then looked at psychological flexibility and the importance of values and how that can connect into the importance and efficacy of self-regulated learning. We examined energy regulation techniques and how effective that can be um, as a centering technique in face-to-face -face and uh, virtually. And finally, looking at the uh, capacity for self-compassion and compassion-focused therapy techniques to help improve well-being. And in closing, I'd like to offer this image I always do because within across individuals and within ourselves different strategies and different tools work at different times so i hope you've taken something from today that can help you think about how you might optimize your well-being and thus hopefully your performance and i thank you for your time